Amen. Uh, greetings to you all in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today I'm extremely privileged to be back in this church after maybe around 15, 20 years, and this time for a different purpose, a different purpose that is to carry the Word of God. Amen. So I'm actually looking around to see if I know any faces that I recognize, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> so if anybody recognizes me, if we had a, a fellowship 15, 20 years back, because at that point of time, uh, the Kirk Youth Fellowship, the Egmore Wesley Fellowship, the EMC Fellowship, and the Matoma Fellowship, we had quite a bond together. We did a lot of things together for the Lord. And I remember those days, and I cherish them, because those days were the days when we were uh, set on fire for the Lord, and the Lord shows us to stand apart, to remain apart, and the Lord shows us that we can preach the gospel to this earth. I mean, so I know because a lot of um, youngsters from um, Wesley, Egmo Wesley as well, they came into the service of the Lord and it was a wonderful experience. I mean, so probably about myself and the ministry, I'll explain to you when the uh, uh, next sermon, the retreat sermon comes in. But today I want to preach unto you a sermon that probably you might have heard it in different versions. But today I'm going to give it unto you in a version that the Lord has revealed unto me. It is the victory in Jesus Christ. And I want to like mention unto you, I think we all follow the NIV Bible over here, but my sermon, I picked it up from the NKJV version. So if you want to follow the verses, I think the verses are ready over there. So there are many kinds of victories that are mentioned in the Bible. God gave his victory to the Israelites when he told them, when you go out into the battle and when you're against your enemies and those people are numerous than you, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God is he who goes with you, Deuteronomy 20 and 4. He's going to fight against, fight for you against your enemies to save you. Hallelujah. This is a victory of promise in warfare that the Lord promised unto the children of Israel. And I believe all our forefathers, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, David, experienced this victory in the Lord God Yahweh. But then, when it comes to the New Testament, Jesus changes everything. Because it's no longer a victory in warfare, it's no longer a physical fight, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57 says, but Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So now we are not called to fight against governments. We are not called to fight against nations. We are not called to fight against man or factions or any of the dictators of this world. But we are called to fight against the principalities, against the powers, against the darkness of this age, against the spiritual forces of this world, because we are not in the flesh anymore, but we have been made alive in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus Christ rose up from the dead, and he also resurrected us in the likeness of him to give us a much greater victory not a victory in warfare, not a victory over the flesh, but a victory over our soul, over the one who wants to devour our soul. Amen. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 4, Paul is saying, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are no longer swords, are no longer missiles, are no longer our uh, shields and no longer our arrows, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, meaning our weapons have transformed from a physical realm to a spiritual realm. The Lord is making us mighty in His Spirit to pull down the strongholds. So for a victory, a victory for a Christian is no longer a war of the worlds. A victory for a Christian is no longer a fist fight till the end. But rather a victory for a Christian is to wear on the armor of God and be able to withstand all the forces of darkness that will come acting upon us. This is where Jesus Christ has changed our entire stance of what we call as victory. 
And Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13 clearly says, it asks us to take up the whole armor of God that we will be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all not to fight, not to conquer, not to run behind your enemies, but just to stand still. Amen. So the Lord God wants us to wear the armor of God not to enter into a battle in this world, not to enter into a war, but the Lord wants us to wear this armor of God, protect ourselves, and just stand still. Be still and know that I am God. This is the promise that the Lord has given unto us. Therefore, victory for a Christian is no longer an offensive position like how we read in the Old Testament, but rather when you come to the New Testament, victory for a Christian is to protect our soul from the evil one. It is a defensive position. Amen. So, this is where I want to point out that we differ from our Israeli brothers, the Jews who are fighting against the Palestinians today. Because the Israelites, the Jews today, they follow a God in the Old Testament, whom we read in the Old Testament. He is a God who recompenses evil with evil. If anybody touches the apple of their eye, who is the Israelites, they have to be destroyed. This is the God of the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus has changed everything. No longer is an eye for an eye. No longer is a tooth for a tooth. If anybody slaps you, you show him the other cheek. If anybody wants your land, you give him double of that. This is the teaching of the New Testament, Jesus Christ, which is different from the Old Testament, Lord God. That is where I'm telling you the victory for a Christian is no longer an offensive fight, but the victory for a Christian is a defensive, it is a protective shell. We need to protect ourselves from all the evil schemes, from all the evil principalities, from all the snares of the devil. This is where our victory lies as a New Testament Christian. But then, let me ask you the question, can we fight our battles being in a defensive position? That is where in Romans 8.37, Paul is saying, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Amen. So we are called to be victorious. Why? Because Jesus Christ loved us. Amen. And though we know all these things, today every Christian is stumbling to find this victory. Because you know why? The Christian doesn't know what a victory is. Today we all think that victory is earning money, having a good career, is to have our bungalows and our cars and our children and our inheritance built up. But no, that is not a victory that is uh, promised according to Jesus Christ. Because these are things that are perishable. These are things that are not permanent. These are temporary. Because if there is a victory from Jesus Christ, then that has to be a permanent reward. It has to be unique. It has to be long withstanding. It has to be a crown of glory on our heads. And that is where... I'm going to teach you today how to attain a spiritual victory and how to experience this victory in Jesus Christ. And for that, I'm going to point out to you five elements that every Christian today, every Christian who believes that we are living in the New Testament should inhibit. And those five things are hope, faith, righteousness, peace, and love. Now, just for the sake of writing a sermon, I didn't write these five points because I'm going to teach you how to attain this victory through the epistles of John. Through John, because today who's going to teach you how to um, attain this victory is the Apostle John. And John is going to teach unto you that if you inhibit these five elements, these five qualities in our spiritual life, then we can stand victorious, we can stand as conquerors, and we can overcome this world. And that is where John is giving a clue in his first epistle, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. And John is telling there, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Amen. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. What is overcoming the world? It is your victory. So if you need to attain this victory, 
you have to be born of God. So this entire sermon is going to be themed around this clue where John is giving born of God. So what it means to be born of God? John chapter 1 verses 12 to 13 very clearly says, but as for many who received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God, meaning you have been born of God. Only if you're born of God, you can become children of God. So Jesus has given us the right to become his children, and we have become the children of God. And how did we become his children? Verse 13 says, those who are not born of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So these are the people who are the children of God, and these are the people who are born of God. Amen. Today we are all sons of God because the Spirit of God leads us. Today our pastor's name is Deva Putran. Deva Putran means son of God. So son of God means what? Being led by the Spirit, Jesus, not only Jesus is the Son of God, but in Romans it is written that anyone who is led by the Spirit of God is called as the Son of God. Amen. So we are called to be sons of God as well. So we have received the Spirit of adoption. We have become a child of God. And those who are born of God, according to John in 1 John 5, 4, whatever is born of God has overcome the world. Hallelujah. So here, this is where I want to teach unto you those five elements, hope, faith, righteousness, peace, and love. And all these things, the Apostle John is going to teach unto us. And the clue is born of God. You have to remember that, born of God. So 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 says, for whatever is born of God, overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. In this verse, John has combined the two elements of hope and faith in this one particular verse. How is that, you may ask? Now, there is a difference between hope and faith. Now, though these two words, many Christians do not know the difference between hope and faith, we still have a confusion. Though these two words are very uh, similar to each other, though they are interlinked with each other, there is still a major difference. Why? Because hope is not specific. Hope is not specific, but faith is specific. I'll say again in a different way. Hope is actually faith itself, but it is faith pinned on an unknown entity. When you have hope on an unknown entity, it is called hope. But when that faith itself, when that hope has an element to believe in, has a substance to believe in, then that hope no longer remains hope, but it will become faith. Let me give you an example. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says that the uh, thoughts I have towards you and the uh, thoughts of peace and evil to give you a future and a hope, meaning the Israelites were given a hope that a Messiah will come one day and he would save them. But the Israelites did not know who will be the Messiah, how would he come, what will be his name, when will he come, or where will he come. The Israelites never knew that. So it was hope because there is no substance. It was hope for the Israelites. But when Jesus Christ was manifested in flesh, now the Israelites know that this is their hope. What? Jesus Christ. Now they have a substance to pin their hope on. Now it no longer remains hope, but now they have a substance, a flesh, a son of God. Now that faith has become hope. Do you understand it? Amen? So, that is where Hebrews 11.1 1 very clearly says, hope, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Meaning, it will only remain hope when there is no substance, but it will remain as hope. It will transform, translate into a faith 
when that hope gets a substance to believe in. Amen. That is why the Greek word for this is called as hypostasios. It means a substance. Now that is why in the New Testament, faith is many times referred to as the living hope. Faith is referred to as the hope of glory. Now coming back to our sermon, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Now you have to understand this word, whatever. Whatever is an unknown entity. Anything can come of God, can be born of God. And anything that is born of God can overcome the world. Now that is hope. That is a hope that we had clinged on to, but now it does not remain just a hope for us, but it has translated into faith because the next part of the verse, John is very clearly explaining, and this is the victory. This is how we overcome. This is the victory that has overcome the world, which is our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So that is exactly how hope has become faith And these two are so essential for a Christian today if we need to attain the victory of Jesus Christ. Amen? So this is exactly what John wants to mention over there. So this is the faith. And the faith in the Son of God is the most important thing that every Christian today has to establish that we translate that hope into faith and know That our hope has got a substance now, and that substance is nothing but the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came to redeem us, who came to give us that victory. This is how we receive the victory in Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is exactly how John explains it in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. And then the third point is righteousness. Righteousness. Now here again, the key word is born of God. Church, you have to remember that word, born of God. 1 John chapter 2, verses two uh, chapter 2 and verse 29, here John is again saying, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him, meaning born of God. So if you have to be victorious, and if you have to take the next step, then what comes next after faith is our righteousness. And if you know that this Jesus Christ is righteous, then we as Christians should also follow the same righteousness in this world. But sadly, we wear a different face to the church. And then when we step out into the world, We throw that righteous face and then we step into our unrighteous life. No, that is not what the Lord desires from us. Because we should not be deceived. He who is righteous, he wants us to be faithful. He wants us to dictate the righteousness that he dictated unto us in the world even after we stepped away from this church. And that is where in 1 John 2.29, John John is saying, everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Amen. So this is very important because Jesus himself has said in Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The moment you seek the kingdom of God, the next thing you need to seek is his righteousness. The moment you've been established in hope and faith, the next thing that we need to pursue is righteousness. Without righteousness, nobody will see God. We have to be really careful. And the fourth point that John is bringing in his epistle is peace. Now peace, again the key word is born of God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. This is very important. If we are born of God, we have to be righteous and we should be without any sin. Because born of God means what? We are born of God means we are conquerors in this world. We have found our victory in Jesus Christ. So if we are born of God, we should not sin. But then he talks about peace in the next part of the verse. But he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Hallelujah. Now, this is exactly the peace that we desire. Because today, 
We do not desire any other peace in this world, but every Christian, every human being in this world wants his peace of mind because this world has become tumultuous. This world has become full of tribulations. Now everyone wants the peace of mind, and this is where God is promising through John, if you are born of God, and if you keep God, then the wicked one will not touch you. Amen. This is where we need to understand that Jesus brought peace into our hearts. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Because Jesus did not bring peace to this world. Many people think Jesus brought peace to this world. Where is the peace in this world? No, Jesus said, I do not bring peace to this world. I brought a sword. So there will be tribulations around you. There will be warfare around you. There will be problems in your workplace. There will be problems in your family. There will be tribulations everywhere. But though there are tribulations in this world, Jesus Christ, who has not given the peace into this earth, has given peace right in your hearts. That's why Jesus is saying, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Amen. That is where we need to know Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. Jesus Christ is promising unto us, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be son, called the sons of God. Sons of God means what? You have been born of God, meaning you have been victorious. You have been declared victorious. Blessed are the peacemakers. Amen. So this is peace. And then the fifth point, that, uh, the fifth element that John wants to teach unto us is love. Again, the clue is born of God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That Jesus, that is the faith. That whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is your faith. Is born of God and everyone who loves him, loves who? The Father, who begot also, who begot also loves him, who is Jesus Christ, who is begotten of him, that we are called to love one another just as the Father, just as Jesus Christ loved us. So if you are born of God, then we ought to love one another as well. And that is where in Romans 8.37, Paul is very beautifully rounding it up. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through what? Through Him who loved us. Yes, because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the kind of sacrificial love that we need to exhibit in this world. Jesus Christ said, John 15, 13, greater love has none than this, than to lay down one's life for one another. Jesus Christ loved you. He laid his life down for you. And we ought to do the same. We ought to think the same. We have to have the same mentality. We should not pronounce hatred in this world. We should not preach hatred. That is where... Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13, now abides faith, hope, and love. Now you understand, these faith and hope are the first two elements which John taught us. And this love is the last element which we saw. And there are three things, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. But I want to emphasize to you, church, of course the greatest is love, but if you do not have the faith, if you do not have the hope, if you do not uh, um, practice righteousness, if you do not practice peace in this world, then love will not exist in you at all. So maybe love is the greatest thing of them all, but if there is no faith and hope, there is no love at all. There is no love in the first place. That is where we need to know 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. John is saying, he who does not love does not know God. Very important for us Christians that we completely tie our lives. 
with the love of Christ in us. We need to have that hope. That hope has to translate into faith. And that faith has to produce righteousness in you. And when you practice righteousness, Jesus Christ will give the peace that is promised into your hearts. And when that peace comes into your heart, then you will have and exhibit the love of Jesus Christ. And when you have these five elements, then you will know that you stand victorious in this, in this world. Amen. Whatever is born of God has conquered the world. You have to be born of God. You have to be called the sons of God. And finally, only if you have these five elements in you, only if you exhibit these five elements in you, can you fight and win the last battle. Do you know what is the last battle that we face in this world? The battle over death. The battle over our flesh to be accepted by the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back in his second coming, when he comes back as a king. And that is exactly what 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to finish the sermon with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 57. Unless you have these five elements and lead a victorious Christian life in this world, you won't be able to win the last battle, which is the battle over death. Today, when we die, or when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, we have to make sure that we defeat death and we are received into the kingdom of God. Isn't it? And that is exactly what Paul is writing. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Because in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And then let's come to verse 54. And there, uh, he's saying in the second part of the verse, death is swallowed up in victory. Death has to be swallowed up in victory. If you only are born of God, and you have those five elements... Can you swallow up death in victory? And then 55, you can proclaim, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, haters, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is Lord. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the victory that we all have to attain. My dear brothers and sisters, Today, to attain this victory which Paul has written regarding the last days, we need to be born of God. We had a hope, but that hope has translated into faith. Now that faith has to produce righteousness, and that righteousness will give unto you the peace of God, and that peace of God will give unto you the love of God in your hearts. If you have all those things, then you are a mature Christian. You are a Christian ready to defeat all the snares that the devil throws at you, who is ready to defeat the tribulations that are around you, who is ready to defeat death when you face it. And this is exactly what the Lord wants us to be. Because 1 John 5, 18 says, we know that Whoever is born of God does not sin. This is exactly the warning God wants to give unto us. We should not sin. Rather, be righteous, be people who have been sought out by the Lord, be people after God's own heart, just like how David received a testimony from the Lord, that this is a man after God's own heart. So should we be a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart. And if we practice every element that John has taught unto us, then we can stand victorious in Christ and we can defeat Satan, we can defeat the evil principalities, and then we can stand victorious on the day of the Lord. Amen? Can we all stand up and pray? And let's all commit ourselves because at this point of time, maybe we are not having these five elements that John had taught unto us. But today the Lord wants us to confess 
and inhibit all these five elements so that on the day of the Lord we will stand victorious, that we will not stand ashamed, that we will not be set for the depths of datas, but Lord, we will be set apart for the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and we, Lord, are chosen for it, Lord. We thank you that he chose us. We thank you that he chose us, Lord, even before we were born. But Lord, when we are in this world, Lord, the devil has thrown everything at us. Lord, this world has thrown everything at us. The world has tried to snare us with its lusts. And the, th- and the world has thrown all its lust of its flesh and the lust of its eyes upon us. But Lord, we will not f- fetter. We will not stumble. We will not fail, Lord. But rather, Lord, we will stand to stand in you and remain victorious in you. Because Jesus, when you come on that day, on that day, Lord Jesus, when you will look up to the heavens and when you descend on the clouds, Lord, we want to come up to you, Lord Jesus. When the trumpets sound, we want to listen to those trumpets, Lord. And Jesus, we want to be lifted up to you. And Jesus, for that, we dedicate ourselves, Lord. We commit ourselves, Lord. We surrender ourselves to the victory of Christ and to be born of you, Lord Jesus. We, Lord Jesus, want to receive the spirit of adoption right now and call you Abba Father, for Lord, in you is all peace, in you is all love, in you is all righteousness, in hope and faith you will establish us, for you my Lord, you have chosen us. Thank you for this day, thank you for the word, in everything Lord Jesus, we give you the glory, in Jesus mighty name, Amen. Amen. Thank you my dear brothers and sisters for this wonderful opportunity, and also thank the pastor Brother Deva Putran, Pastor Deva Putran, for this opportunity. God be with you all. Amen.